Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you that I don't know, I'm Don Elliman. I'm, I'm honored to be the chancellor of this campus. And, and uh, to the few hardy souls, I'm lucky. With, I think weather defeated the purpose, some of the purpose of this. But I do think it's very important that we have this event. Uh, I know that there are far more people watching on Zoom right now than are standing in front of me. And I, but I'm very, very grateful for the people who've taken the trouble to come out here. Um, I want to thank the deans, all of whom are present here today, with the exception of John Samet, who's in Rhode Island and wishes he could be here. Um, you know, this is obviously a, an incredibly difficult time for, has been an incredibly difficult time for everybody. For we, we tend to look back on it and say it was 10 months ago in May, but the reality is it started decades, centuries ago. And, and continues to this day. And, and while yesterday may have brought some sort of immediate sense of relief to some of us, I, I don't know about you, but I, I find it kind of hard to celebrate the fact that justice was done over the loss of a life of a, of a human being. Uh, on the one hand, obviously, it is good that justice was done. On the other hand, uh, George Floyd's not coming back, and neither is Breonna Taylor or Elijah McClain or you know, countless others. And there will be countless more to follow. I don't doubt that for a minute. I don't think anybody can. So while it's important that we, I think, um, respect and, and at some level feel gratified at the verdict that came down yesterday, um, it, I think it's, it's sobering to know how much lies ahead and, and what we have in front of us. We live in a, we often say we live in a divided society. I would actually argue we live in a fractured society, fractured in so many different ways right now. And, uh, and, and our role in our, in our, on this campus is a role of, of hope and healing. That's what we're about. So our task going forward, and, and in that I enlist your aid, is simply to try to figure out what we can do collectively and individually uh, to contribute to the hope and healing of the society that so badly needs our help. Um, you know, I, we're, we're going to look to you to help us figure out how we build programs that address systemic racism, that address so many of the other um, uh, uh, discriminatory needs that we have in our society. And we, we not only in, invite, we encourage and may even demand uh, that you help us figure out what roads we should be traveling down as a campus and as individuals on the campus. Um, the need is great. Uh, we have very, very much to do, and so it's time that we got on with it. I'm gonna turn the podium over now to Dr. Regina Richards, who is the newly minted Vice Chancellor for uh, D Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Community Outreach, and, and uh, she will introduce, I think, one or more speakers. So thank you again for coming today. Uh, I really appreciate your attention, and uh, please, please help us chart a path so that we can make a difference in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Elliman. Thank you all so much for being here. Our, our deans, our uh, leaders here, and all of you who I believe are leading with us in this charge. First of all, I'd like to take a moment and read our land acknowledgement. As we're working towards um, equity, we wanna be sure that we are gathering and acknowledging um, those that have come before us. So we humbly acknowledge that University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of indigenous peoples. Our campus resides on unceded lands of the Arapaho people established to the Treaty of Fort Larimer in 1851. We recognize the enduring presence of more than 40,000 indigenous people in the greater Denver area. The sprawling urban American Indian and Alaskan native presence in Denver consists of other tribes to Colorado such as Apache, Comanche, Shoshone and Ute community members, yet 
is now home to numerous other indigenous people from many of the 560 plus federally recognized tribes in this country. Together we acknowledge the history of genocide and ongoing system inequities. While respecting treaties made on this territory as a step towards reconciliation and strengthening relationships with indigenous people. We give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty and right to self-determination. We recognize the lessons, including many medical and public health lessons indigenous communities have offered and continue to teach us. Today we stand in solidarity to acknowledge the public rendering of accountability for the, George, for the murder of George Floyd. We know that there are many who have suffered the tragedies, the trauma as it relates to senseless killings and murders and so many other injustices. We would be remiss if we did not acknowledge Elijah McLean here in our own Aurora area. We find ourselves, and I'm gonna speak specifically about myself and, uh, and believe that it probably resonates as Chancellor Elliman said, with others. We're in a place of shock. We're in a place of hope. Trying to really recognize what this level of structural systemic accountability means going forward. I believe in the words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his Audacity of Hope speech. Though modified, I'd like for you to join me in a moment of imagery. If you choose to close your eyes, you can. But when you do, and if you do, I implore you to dream with the audacity of hope. Hope that we are moving towards a world where we see all persons through the lens of humanity, regardless of our differences, and that we are valued. That we have policies, structures, systems that are constructed on the principles of equity and where barriers are eliminated. That systems of accountability are equitable and senseless killings and violence have ceased. I implore you to have the audacity, the audacity of hope that our vision for a better and just nation and world becomes our reality and that the history and the presence of oppression, marginalization, and inequities no longer coexist. Here on our campus, we are working towards those systems of change, of equity, and of justice for our internal communities, for our external communities, and for the health of all the communities we serve. I would like to also add that we take a moment and to just breathe. The last time that I was before you, almost a year ago, we were talking about the eight minutes and 49 seconds that George Floyd could not breathe. But now I need us to exhale for just a moment and to remain, even though exhausted, hopeful, faithful, encouraged, and committed to this work. We are leading together and we will not stop until justice is truly for all. Thank you. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Shanta Zimper, Zimmer, to speak next, and after her will follow Michael Gallagher, who is the president of our Student Senate, and um, also in the Masters of Public Health program here uh, on our campus in our School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you, Regina, Vice Chancellor. 
Thank you for inviting me to say a few words today. Um, when Regina asked me to, to speak about what this um, experience has meant to me around the murder of George Floyd and the verdict yesterday in the trial, um, I had a difficult time um, coming up with words of my own. Um, I like to echo the words of others instead. Um, first, in alignment with Chancellor Elliman's comments about it being difficult to celebrate right now, um, I would quote our Vice President um, who said yesterday, a measure of justice is not the same as equal justice. And while I'm grateful that our minority communities and especially the black community of our students and our faculty and staff have seen this as a pathway towards justice, um, and I was not surprised that Vice Chancellor Richards would share comments of hope, I'd like to take us back to our, June 13th, our Juneteenth celebration um, in June, shortly after the murder of George Floyd, and share with you a poem from 1893. Sympathy by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I know what the cage bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass, and the river flows like a stream of glass. When the first bud sing bird sings and the first bud opes, and the faint perfume from its chalice steals. I know what the cage bird feels. I know why the cage bird beats his wing till its blood is red on the cruel bars, for he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on a bough a swing. And a pain still throbs in the old, old scars, and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wing. I know why the cage bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free, it is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the cage bird sings. Striking to me that in 1893, um, these words were written and then grew into a poem by Maya Angelou in 1970, and then were capitalized again um, by the words of Amanda Gorman at the inauguration in January of this year. We have a lot of work to do. This is a measure of justice, but not an equality of justice. Um, and let's try to move faster than we've been moving over the last two centuries. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Michael Gallagher. I am coming representing the Student Senate as the Student Senate President. Um, I wrote down some words, so I'm going to pull that out. So, <clears throat> I wanna start first by echoing um, the message that Dr. Zimmer and Dr. Richards were saying, Dr. Richards' message of hope, but Dr. Zimmer's um, emphasis on the work that we need to do now. And I wanna thank you all for being here today um, in solidarity and support for black, indigenous, and POC communities locally and nationally. And here in solidarity and support for the abolition of our racist systems that perpetuates violence and harm against these communities. Yesterday at around 3.07 p.m., Minneapolis police officer who murdered George Floyd was found guilty on all charges, manslaughter, third degree murder, and second degree murder. Less than an hour earlier in Ohio, a Columbus police officer shot and killed 15-year-old Micaiah Bryant. There have only been three days this year where U.S. police have not extrajudicially killed someone. I've been glued to social media, Twitter and the like, reading reactions from many news sources and countless activists. Oops. Before the verdict was read, it felt as if the whole country was holding its breath. Something that is wild to consider 
given the huge abundance of evidence and the clarity of the situation. It was murder. Even with more evidence and witnesses than would be necessary in any other situation, we were unsure of the outcome of Jurors would make the correct decision. Now, the terms justice and accountability were utilized near ubiquitously by news organizations and politicians, justice and accountability. Now, I don't want to underplay the importance of the verdicts yesterday. It was an historic moment, one brought up not because of our justice system or because it is just, but it was because of the collective strength of activists in Minneapolis and nationally. Janella Frazier was 17 years old, and she was the young woman who filmed this incident. George Floyd's family, activists in the Minnesota Freedom Fund and activists nationally, cried out for the Hennepin County District Attorney to add the more severe charge of second-degree murder. Was the correct outcome of this case reached? Yes. Was justice provided? I'm not so certain. George Floyd was still murdered, and police are still murdering black and brown people to this day. As activist and media director for the Oakland's non-for-profit plant, Planting Justice, Ashley Yates tweeted yesterday, I don't like this shift folks are trying to make towards calling this guilty verdict accountability. It is not that. It is a punitive consequence for one individual, and that's it. And to tie this back to us as students on this campus, we're a health professions campus and we have the opportunity to be leaders and change makers. We can take the, um, where we can follow in the footsteps of the activists that have come before us in dismantling these systems of oppression. So, as future leaders, change makers, and activists, we as students can push our society forward we can dismantle white supremacy, colonialism, and racism, and the systems like policing that allow these harms to perpetuate. So with that, I want to leave you all with um, something from our vice president, Hana Billy Jeru. Our nation has been systematically oppressing and murdering citizens. One of the biggest beasts we face today that we must tear down to see any form of change is the prison industrial complex. Sending Chauvin to prison legitimizes this system, but we as a community can break it down. Thank you, Michael and uh, Hannah, who could not be with us today, but sent her message. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jan Gascoigne, and I'm privileged to serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and I'm also an Associate Professor in the Colorado School of Public Health. As the speakers before me have shared today, it is a time for us to acknowledge the historical and current individual and collective pain and grief. It is a time for us to recognize the verdict in this one trial that has rendered accountability. And it is time for us to make a commitment to take action in addressing racial and societal injustices. While we don't have all the answers, we would like to offer our campus a call to action for those who would like to participate. We invite you to sign a pledge of solidarity as a member of our campus community dedicated to helping bring forth healing and change. Today we have a banner here for those who would like to sign it. Or if you are joining us virtually, you can also sign the pledge by scanning the posted QR codes or using the link in today's campus email. We will combine all of your signatures and post the pledge in our education buildings as a visible reminder of our shared commitment. Now I will read the pledge aloud. 
As a member of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus community, I stand in solidarity with my peers and colleagues in a shared commitment. I pledge to work with my CU Anschutz community to address and heal racial and societal inequities locally and nationally in our health, education, judicial, law and, and law enforcement systems. Chancellor Elliman and Chief Rapola, would you like to sign the pledge to start us off? Next, I would like to invite the deans, the vice chancellors, and associate vice chancellors. I would like to invite our shared governance leaders, Michael Gallagher, student president of the Student Senate, and Cindy O'Brien, uh, faculty assembly. And before we invite the audience to, to come and sign, I'd like to uh, hand the podium over to Dr. Richards, who will share details of the caucus events available for those who wish to stay and participate. Thank you so much, Dr. Gascoigne. Um, in conclusion, I wanted to, first of all, also invite our colleague, Dr. Dominic Martinez, Associate Vice Chancellor for the Office of Inclusion and Outreach, to please come up and sign the pledge as well. And as we conclude, I want to invite you all, if you would like to join any of the, what we are calling caucuses, after this presentation, after this, I'm sorry, um, solidarity gathering, refer to the um, announcement that has gone out at 1.30. We will have four in-person caucuses here, and the room numbers will be attached to those, um, that message. 
as well as Zoom caucuses. So feel free, we have faculty, staff members who have agreed to have open sessions where you can come and debrief or sit in silence with others or do whatever you need to do to take care of yourselves today and to stay encouraged to move on for tomorrow. Thank you all so much for being here.